Okay, this, excuse me, this is section 7.7, .7, which is the graphs of tangent, cotangent, cosecant, and secant functions. So like the sine and cosine functions, the following tables can be completed along with plotting points to create the graph of the tangent, cotangent, cosecant, and secant functions. <clears throat> excuse me. The period of the tangent function is pi. Um, so you only need to look at an interval of values that covers the length and after all that, the graph. So if you want one period, instead of using from zero to pi, which is the length of one pi, they decided to use negative pi over two and pi over two. So here's zero and then pi over two and pi over two. So that length is still one pi, okay? And the reason they chose to use that interval is because um, if I choose zero to pi, you're basically gonna have a piece of a graph, an asymptote, and then another piece of a graph. Because we do know that um, tangent is undefined at pi over two, okay? Um, so here there's going to be an asymptote and I think I wanna draw it in red but there will be an asymptote at pi over two and also at negative pi over two. And you can tell that with the table as well because when you try to do tangent of negative pi over two in your calculator, tangent of negative pi over two, oops, you get error, right? So that tells me that that value is undefined. When the reason it's undefined is because there's an asymptote there. There's not actually a picture of a graph there. Now, um, for the next one, we're going to go ahead. I'm just going to copy that and change this to a four. I get negative one. For um, negative pi over six, we get negative square root of three over three, but so that I can graph it, I'm gonna get the decimal representation. So it's about um, 0 0.6. And then tangent of zero, that one I can type in. Tangent of zero is just zero. And then tangent of positive pi over six, I'm just gonna delete the, um, bless you. Um, oops. Oh no, I did too much. Okay, let's start over. So I get square root of three over three, which we already know is gonna be 0. 0.6, but positive this time. And then tangent of pi over four, which is one. Tangent of pi over three is square root of three which is approximately positive 1.73, and then tangent of one half, which we already know is gonna be undefined. Yep, it's undefined. Okay, so this one is undefined. So there's no point then, it's just undefined. Okay, and here we get the point negative pi over four and negative one. Here, negative pi over six and negative square root of three over three. Now, if you're having to list the points in the computer, I suggest using the exact form. But if you're trying to draw it on your own paper, which is what you will need to do on the test, um, use a decimal version so that way um, you know where this point is gonna be. Because I can't look at the number square root of three over three and just know where that is. I have to figure out what the decimal is before I can tell you where that's going to land, okay? But in the computer, you wanna use the exact points, and then when you're drawing it on your paper, that's when you use the decimal point. So I'm going to draw, um, well, I already have my asymptote here, right? So we know this is an asymptote, and we know this one is an asymptote, and then we're gonna go here, negative pi over three and negative 1.73, so about right here. Then negative pi over four, which is actually right here between zero and pi halves is negative pi fourths. 
and we get negative one. And then negative pi over six is going to be um, negative 0.6, so about right here. And then zero, zero. And then um, pi over six and 0.6, so it's about right there. Pi over four, which is in the middle here, and one. And then pi over three and 1.73, which is about right here. And if I connect my dots, what ends up happening is it kind of looks like a cubic function. Just a little bit like a cubic function, okay? Now this is just one period. We know that tangent involves sine and cosine, but we know that essentially this is gonna repeat over here and it's gonna repeat over here as well. And it just keeps repeating over and over and over and over um, every period. So we've got the one period there and then we're going to need this table of properties to do a couple of problems in the homework assignment. So it says the domain is all real numbers except odd multiples of pi and they could be positive odd multiples or negative odd multiples, right? Negatives are still considered odd numbers. Um, there's negative odds and negative evens, right? The range is all real numbers because it does go downward to negative infinity and upward to positive infinity. And the it is an odd function because if I were to flip just this section that's in quadrant one, if I were to flip it, mirror it over the y-axis, it would be here. And then if I were to mirror that over the x-axis, it would land right on top of itself. So that means it's an odd function and that it's um, symmetric with respect to the origin. Um, the tangent function is periodic with a period of pi. That's the, the width here. It'll repeat every pi unit. And see, if I would have gone from zero to pi, I would have ended up with half of this curve, the asymptote, and then half of that curve. And that's why we don't really use zero to pi. For tangent, we always go in between the two asymptotes. So negative pi over two to pi over two. The x-intercepts are going to be your multiples of pi. So zero, pi, eventually over here, I would have another dot at pi. Over there, I would have another dot at negative pi. And the y-intercept is zero, so it does cross the y-axis at the origin. And then your vertical asymptotes are gonna occur at all of those odd multiples of pi. So, Let's see what we've got next. So here it says graphing the functions of this form. So again, I'm going to use my transformations. There's a couple of problems in the uh, homework assignment that have to do with this uh, concept. And so I really need to remember my transformations and what I'm supposed to be doing to the graphs and all of that good stuff, right? Um, so I kind of wrote those notes in here. It says, what is gonna be the basic function of this function? Since the trig function is tangent, my basic function is going to be y equals tan of x. Just x all by itself, okay? So um, we're gonna use all the same points. Now I don't use the pi over three and the pi over six, just because they gave me some weird decimals, right? They gave me this decimal, this decimal, this decimal, and that decimal. I just want to use the points that um, are actual like nice points. So I definitely need the asymptote. And then I'm going to use this because negative one is a nice number I can plot really easy. Zero is a nice number I can plot easy. And one is a nice number that I can plot easy. And then of course the other asymptote. So I only took negative pi over two, negative pi over four, zero, pi over four, pi over two so that I could get um, those key points, kind of like what we did when we were doing the sine and cosine function. We had five key points. Here, these are the five key points for tangent, okay? So I already know those values. I know that this one is undefined. I know that this one is undefined, and I just had a dyslexic moment there. Okay. And then I know that negative pi over four is negative one, tangent of zero is zero, and tangent of pi over four is one. And if you ever forget those values, you can just use your calculator. 
what you're going to need to rem remember is to use these x values, okay? But you could always use your calculator to find the y values if you don't remember that part always, okay? And if you're making a note sheet, I would definitely have this table on there. I'd have the table for sine, the table for cosine, the table for tangent, one for cotangent, and so on and so forth. I'd have those five key points, that chart, in my note sheet for sure, because it definitely helps. So then now we have to identify the two transformations that's being done. So the first thing that I see is this being done on the inside. Um, and And so what it's doing is since it, which means I'm going to take all of my x values and then I'm going to subtract pi over 4 from those x values, okay? So if I take this x value right here, um, negative pi, oops, pi over 2, and I take away pi over 4, I get negative 3 pi over 4. Now the y value is not changing here. I'm not doing anything to the y value, so it will stay undefined. And before I keep going, because I do want to keep finish this table, I'm going to mention the other um, the other transformation that's happening. Because it's minusing one on the outside, that means I'm going to have a vertical shift downward, and that means I'm going to take all my y values and then subtract one from those y values to get the new y value. Now I never do both transformations together. I always do one transformation at a time just to avoid making careless errors, okay? Um, not only that, is you notice that these are not multiple transformations, these are both um, combination, uh, add and subtract transformations. So I was adding this pi over four and I was subtracting that one. So these are done in the same, um, you could do them in any order, it doesn't matter what order you do them. Because I don't have any multiple, like a number in front here or a number multiplied by my x there, because I don't have that situation happening, um, those are the ones, the transformations I would have to do first before I did the add and subtract transformation, okay? And since we don't have any multiple transformations, that's why I'm just going on and starting with my add and subtract uh, transformations. Here, negative pi over 4 minus pi over 4 is going to be negative 2 pi over 4, which is pi over 2. Y value stays the same. Um, if you ever second guess your numbers, always just plug it in to make sure. Um, 0 minus pi over 4 is going to be negative pi over 4. Pi over 4 minus pi over 4 is going to be 0. And pi over 2 is going to be pi over 4. Again, if you don't have confidence in yourself, um, you can always double check the calculator just to be sure, okay? And so then the y values are gonna stay exactly the same. Now I'm going to subtract one from my y values. Well, you cannot subtract one from something that doesn't exist, right? So this still will remain undefined. Similarly for pi over four, this will remain with zero. So these are the values that we end up with. So let's see. Um, I do need to label this. This is negative pi over 4. This is negative 3 pi over 4. Um, and this is positive pi over 4. And I won't need the rest of this graph because that's it. So I'm going to draw my asymptote. I do like to put them in red so that they stand out over the um, lines of the grid and then one at positive pi over four. And I guess you could repeat one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So if you wanted to, you could do another period on the graph. It's just gonna be a mirror image of this one. So we've got negative pi over two and negative two. So I know that this first unit is gonna be down at negative two. Then negative pi over four and negative one. So I know another uh, unit over, it's going to be at negative 1. Um, at 0, it's going to be 0. 
So one more unit over, it's going to be zero. And then pi over four is undefined. Okay, now here's where we're going to have it. There's my three points. The one in the middle is the center. So this is going to go upward like this. And then this one's going to go downward like that. Again, upward like that and downward like that. And I'm trying my best to make them look the same, but they, it's me drawing. So of course it's going to look off. I'm not fantastic at drawing. You just don't want it to look like a straight line. That's all. Because it does need to curve so that it doesn't touch this um, uh, asymptote. Same thing with this one. It needs to curve so it doesn't touch the asymptote. If I just draw it straight, it's going to cross through those asymptotes, right? It does need to be a little bit curvy on the paper. If you're doing the homework, there will be choices to select, so that's nice. And if you're doing the test, um, depending on the problem, some of them will just say draw it on your paper, and some of them will actually have you choose between some uh, multiple choices. So um, it'll just depend on that problem. Either you'll need to draw it on your paper. You have to draw it on your paper regardless of what you pick. Um, so just get in the habit of trying to draw those a little bit curvy. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the cotangent. And so then they've picked all of these values here. But once we have this big table, we're going to use this big table to um, find the five key points. Okay. And so then we'll use those five key points to draw anything that happens to have like a shift like this. So if it has a shift, we have to figure out or a reflection. And then the same thing with cosecant. Um, the same thing, oh, that's cosecant. So we didn't get one for co um, cotangent, but it'll be the same way. Once you have the five key points, then you can uh, do all the shifting and all of that to your cotangent. And then I will go ahead and talk about the key points for um, cosecant and secant. So we have some information here about cosecant and secant, but we'll talk, I'll give you the chart here for cosecant and I'll give you the chart here for um, secant so that you have those for your key points. Um, and I'll actually show you how to derive the key points, okay? Now, because um, there's really only one set of key points that you have to memorize, and then the rest of them, you can get them off of that. So if you can memorize the key points for sine, cosine, and tangent, then um, you can just use those to figure out the, um, the key points for secant or cosecant, secant, and then cotangent. But let's go ahead and do this one so we can put all that information together and figure out how it's connected. So it, the period of cotangent is also pi because remember tangent and cotangent are co-functions of one another. So the period of one will be the period of the other. So since tangent has a period of pi, so does cotangent. And so then on this one, there is no asymptotes at odd multiples of pi. There's actually asymptotes at um, just are not multiples of pi over two. For cotangent, the asymptotes or the undefined values happen at multiples of just pi. So like zero pi, two pi, negative pi, negative two pi, those things, okay? So in this case, um, to get one whole full period, like one whole image, um, instead of like half of one and half of another, we're not gonna take from negative pi over two to pi over two. What we're gonna take is from zero to pi. And so that is important um, information there. So, Let's go ahead and look at these. So you may want to have a key points for cotangent then because it's not going to be the same um, points as tangent. So I will put a table over here to get the key points for cotangent as well. So maybe there's four you need. So here I'm going to do cotangent of pi over four. And now how do I do cotangent in my calculator? There's no button that says cotangent. So I have to do one over the tangent of pi over four. Um, we get one and then the same thing, but now we're going to do pi over three. 
we get square root of 3 over 3, which we know was 0 0.6. And then now pi over 2, that's error, so it's been defined. And then Let me do that again. Cotangent is also cosine of pi over 2 um, over sine of pi over 2. And so we get 0. I knew that shouldn't be undefined. Um, and then we'll just keep this kind of fashion to do 2 pi over 3. So 2 pi over 3. Oops. 2 pi over 3, and we get negative square root of 3 over 3, which is negative 0 0.6, and then we'll do the same for 3 pi over 4. Oh no, dang it, I just deleted it. Three pi over four. Three pi over four. And we get negative one. And then now we're going to do five pi over six. And five pi over six. We get negative square root of three, which is negative 1.73. And then now pi. So fraction cosine of pi over sine of pi. And we get error, you cannot divide by zero. So this one is undefined. So for those two that are undefined, that's going to cause us to have this asymptote at zero. And then it's going to cause us to have um, an asymptote here at pi. Then, um, and we also know because it's going to have asymptotes at multiples of pi, there's also an asymptote there. So we can do the same thing like we did up there, where once we have one side, we can just mirror it over. So pi over 6, so let me see. Um, this is pi over 4 and 3 pi over 4. And then... This is pi over 6 and pi over 3. So this is 2 pi over 3 and 5 pi over 6 with 3 pi over 4 in the middle. Okay, so now we can plot. Pi over 6 is going to go up 1.73, so about there. And then pi over 4 is going to be um, 1. And then pi over, or pi over 4 is going to be 1. Pi over 3 is going to be 0. 0.6. Pi over 2 is going to be 0. And 2 pi over 3 is going to be negative 0. 0.6. 3 pi over 4 is going to be negative 1. And then 5 pi over 6 is going to be negative 1.76. So it has that same curvature like the tangent does, but notice it is um, swapped over, right? This one's going up to the right and this one's going up to the left, okay? And it's going down to the right. So it's a little bit different. And then if I repeat that same kind of action, um, just using the key points, we have this, okay? And so for cotangent, you want to, your key points you want to use are going to be pi over 4, actually no, 0 first, 0, pi over 4, pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, and pi. And then these are the ones that will create one whole period, and then you can just do all of your transformations to it. 
So for zero, we know we're going to have an asymptote. Um, for pi over four, we're going to get one. Here we're going to get zero. Here we're going to get negative one. And here we're going to have another asymptote, right? And so that's what you're going to use for your key points whenever you try to graph um, these sort of things, where you're having multiples or you're adding or subtracting things that's going to shift the graph around. Okay. Now we're going to briefly talk about cosecant um, and secant. So it says, to graph the cosecant and secant functions, recall the relationship between these functions and the sine and cosine functions. So remember that cosecant is the reciprocal of sine, secant is the reciprocal of cosine. And because of this reciprocal um, relationship, the reciprocal of the y coordinate um, for any given number of x will be a point on the co-function. So for instance, this point here is on the sine function. If I take the reciprocal of one half, I get two over one, which is two. So that means that the point pi over six with the reciprocated y value will be a point on the cosecant function. And then since the point pi over zero is on the sine function, then there exists a vertical asymptote. Why? Because when I try to take the reciprocal of zero over one, I get one over zero, which is undefined. Right? So you get the point pi and then undefined. That doesn't make any sense. You can't graph that. It's a vertical asymptote. Okay? And that's going to happen at all multiples of pi, just like um, for every multiple of pi, you get zero for the sine function. And so they just give you some imagery here so that you can see the relationship. So they're going to share these points at odd multiples of pi over two. And they're going to share, um, but what's going to happen is that instead of it going downward like it does in this interval, it's going to go upward. And there's your asymptotes at multiples of pi. And the same thing here. Instead of it curving upward, it curves downward instead with an asymptote at zero. Instead of curving downward like the sine function, the cosecant goes upward. And there's the curve. So we definitely need to have those key points. Now we know that the period of sine is 2 pi. So we know that the period, I'm going to use t or period, of sine is 2 pi. So that means that the period of cosecant is also 2 pi. And when we graph sine, we always use 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. So it's going to be the same thing. for cosecant. And then, in, then we have to take the cosecant values. So if I find, let's see, sine of zero, right, it's zero. What is the reciprocal of zero? Um, one over zero is undefined, right? So this is going to be undefined. Then let's do um, sine of pi over two we get one. What is the reciprocal of one? It's just one. Then we have sine of pi, which is zero. Again, when you do the reciprocal, you get undefined. And then three pi over two, you get negative one. What is the reciprocal of that? It's negative one still. And then sine of two pi is gonna be zero. So when you take the reciprocal of that, it's undefined. And so the key points that I get here when I draw this is I'm going to have a um, vertical asymptote at zero, I'm going to have a vertical asymptote at pi, and I'm going to have a vertical asymptote at two pi. And then I'm going to have the point zero and pi over two, or pi over two and one, I'm sorry, three pi over two and negative one. And then from there, I have to remember what the basic shape of cosecant looks like because I don't have any other information. You could pick values like negative pi over four and pi over four if you really wanted to, um, but all you need to know is that, um, and then you would get this y value up here and you'd get a y value up there, something like that. And then you would know that it's curving upward. But if you remember the basic shape for cosecant, you remember that it goes upward first, in this first thing, it's going to go upward, 
and then in the second one it's going to go downward so if you have like that sort of notes with you on the test that's all you need to graph it okay is just to know what that basic shape looks like just like you know that an x squared function looks like a regular parabola right or just like you know that the absolute value of x looks like a v you need to know the basic shapes of just like we know the basic shapes of these functions or how you know a cube looks like this, right? Or that a linear looks like a line. These are your basic fit shapes of your algebraic expression functions. Now we need to memorize the basic shapes of our trig function, okay? So we know sine and cosine look like waves. We know secant and cosecant look like a bunch of U's and uh, hills and valleys, right? With a bunch of asymptotes. And we know that tangents kind and cotangents kind of look like um, x cubed functions, right? Okay, so then let's take um, this information here. So now they're talking about cosine and secant, right? And so the same thing goes because they're reciprocal functions of one another, the y values can be found by taking the reciprocals. So, um, and then because you get these points when you try to do the reciprocal of zero, you get. Uh, one over zero, which is undefined. So that's why there's vertical asymptotes there. But I'm going to take the same thing. The period is going to be the same as cosine. And we know that the period of cosine is the same as sine. So they still have that two pi. And so we're going to take those same points as our key points. And we already know that um, this one's going to be a little bit different, actually. You're going to want to take, um, this is enough. You'll be fine. So if we have 0 and then we try to plug that into cosine, Cosine of zero is one, and when I reciprocate that, I get one. Cosine of pi over two is zero, and when I reciprocate that, I'm gonna get undefined. Um, cosine of pi is negative one, so when I reciprocate negative one, this one's gonna be undefined. And then cosine of 2 pi is going to be 1. When I reciprocate that, I get 1. So that means I'm going to have an asymptote at pi over 2 and an asymptote at 3 pi over 2. And I'm only graphing from 0 to 2 pi. So this is the portion of the graph that I am graphing. And then I can just repeat it. Um, over and over and over on the other on this side and on that side right because the whole thing is a period it's going to repeat so this blue box is going to repeat over here it's going to repeat over there and keep repeating on both ends so let's see the point zero and one so zero and one is here the point pi and negative one is here and then the point two pi is going and one is going to be here and so essentially what happens is this one has the opposite behavior of secant, of cosecant. So cosecant went uh, upward first. This one went downward next. This does the same, but notice that it's shifted over. So instead of this little dip being here at pi over 2, if I were to shift it backwards, right, you'd shift it to the left um, pi over 2 unit, then I would be the same as this one, okay? And so it's the same exact graph, it's just shifted over. So for here in this section, you're gonna get half of that um, graph there. And then for this section, you're gonna get the whole downward curve. And then for this section, you're gonna get the left side of that upward curve, okay? And so you can use the same points to do that, or you can choose to use a different set of um, key points. So for y equal to secant x, just so that I have a full upward curve and a full downward curve, I would actually suggest that you use negative pi over 2, 0, pi over 2, 
pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. Oh, I missed pi. That's why. I was like, wait a minute. I'm supposed to have five key points, right? And so then if I look at this, that's actually focusing on negative pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. And so really, I'm concentrating on this part in here. And if you look at this part in here, and I've got a lot of lines all over the place. If you look at this part in here, you'll notice that you have one full upward curve and one full downward curve. And so then what are the values here? This one's undefined because there's an asymptote right there. This one will be one. This one will be undefined, another asymptote in the middle. Pi will be negative one, and then another asymptote over there. And so you'll use these values to figure out your, um, your movements, okay? So you'll use these to do all of the transformation. So I wouldn't use this one because it won't give you the full upward curve and then the full downward curve, okay? So don't use these. Use these for secant. Use these for, um, what was I doing, cosecant over here. So now we've got the tables for everything, right? We've got the tables for sine. We've got the table five key points for cosine. We have the five key points for tangent. We have the five key points for cotangent, right? These are the five key points for tangent. These were the five key points for cotangent. Um, these are the five key points for cosecant, and these x values are the same for sine and cosine. It's just the y values will be different. And then these are the key points for secant. So secant is a little off. Secant, tangent, and cotangent do not have the same x values as sine, cosine, and cosecant. They just don't, okay? So here, I'm going to draw this. Now, I don't need to go back to my sine function since we already discussed how to get the, um, the key points for cosecant. So if you look up here for my key points for cosecant, I'm just using that same table. And so I know that this one's going to be undefined. I know this one's going to be 1, undefined again, negative 1, and undefined again. And so then I know that this one's supposed to go upward and this one's supposed to go downward. Now what we have to do is we have to, um, we have to do these transformations. So how do I, this is multiplying by a negative and this one is subtracting a pi over two. So I have to do the multiplication one first. And what does it do? It takes the y value and it changes the sign of that y value. That's what putting a negative in the front will do. So, well, undefined, it doesn't matter if I flip it over, it's still going to be the same asymptote. Here, if I flip it over, I get negative 1. But remember, a negative in the front flips it over. So it's not going to look like that anymore. It's actually going to go downward now. Then undefined, again, you cannot flip a, I mean, you can flip an asymptote, but it just looks exactly the same. Here, if I change that, it's going to be positive 1 and undefined. Now, remember, this is a reflection over the x-axis, which means the whole thing flips over. So instead of it going downward, it's actually going to go upward in this section now. And then finally, the last transformation I can do is the one that's being added or subtracted. And how do I do that? I take the x values, and I'm going to add pi over 2 to those x values. So then I'm going to take this x value and add pi over 2. The y value is going to stay exactly the same. Pi over 2 and pi over 2 will be pi. Y value stays the same. Pi plus pi over 2 is 3 pi over 2. And defined stays the same. I'm still moving downward. It's just shifting over to the right. Um, 3 pi over 2 and pi over 2 will be pi. Y value stays the same. And then 2 pi and pi over 2, that's going to be 4 pi over 2. So this will be 5 pi over 2 and undefined. And it should be going upward over here just like it was before. 
So let's graph it. We have um, pi over two and undefined. So we've got an asymptote here. Um, three pi over two, we've got another asymptote there. Five pi over two, we have another asymptote there. And you do have more asymptotes, <clears throat> excuse me. Notice that they're happening every two units width, right? Every pi over two over. But you can repeat it. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So I get pi and negative one, and this one's supposed to go downward. Then I get, um, oh wait, we have an issue here. Three pi over two, oh, three pi over two plus pi is going to give me four pi over two, which is two pi. There we go. So then two pi and one is here, and this one is supposed to go upward. And then you're just repeating this process. So down first, then up. So down first, and then up. But I can only draw half of that one. And then this one went down, so this one will go up. And then this one is up, so this is downward, but again, only half, because I don't have the rest of the graph, right? But this is the one um, area that we got from the points. And then the rest of it, we just repeated the whole periodic activity, right? Um, and so that's how you graph these. So it seems really difficult, and this chapter was super difficult for me as a student. But once I realized that if I could memorize or at least have on hand with me <clears throat> the five tables, then, <clears throat> and I memorized or had on hand with me those transformations, I could graph any of these trig functions. And so that's really, really, really what um, helped me figure out this chapter. Otherwise, I was in the dark completely about this chapter. But once I made that connection that, hey, I have these five key points, and then all I'm doing is transformations to it, or I have these five key points and I'm doing transformations to it, um, that really helped me. And not only that helped me, but <clears throat> being able to decode the transformations for myself also helped me. So I was always confused, like, yes, the graph shifts up and it shifts down and it shifts to the left and it shifts to the right. Fantastic. But what does that really mean? What am I doing? Like, how do I figure that out? Um, that was really difficult in itself as well. So um, I'm trying to find my page where I have the transformation. And I seem to be, there it is. Um, so when I made this chart that I shared in like, I think it was 7.6, um, this chart really, really helped me. So yes, the book tells you to do this. This is the information that the book will give you. It'll give you this. What I had to do is go in for myself and figure out, well, what does that mean I'm going to be doing to my point, okay? And so this information that I have at the bottom isn't necessarily provided in the books. It's just information that I figured out that that's what was happening and that's what we're supposed to be doing to those points to make it stretch by a factor of whatever or to make it um, stretch horizontally by a factor. I had to do this kind of action, right? Um, when I have this, that means I'm supposed to be adding that number to my y coordinates. When I have um, plus on the inside, I'm supposed to be subtracting that value from my x coordinates. So this information really, really, really helped me because yes, you want to know what the book wants you to do, but then you need to know how to actually do it. And that's something that I have no idea why the books don't include that information, um, but they kind of just leave it to you to figure it out and to do it. You know what I mean? They just keep saying, this is what's happening, now do it. But how, right? Um, so once you have all of that decoded for yourself and you have all these key points handy, the rest of it just falls into place. And so that's, not necessarily my gift to you, but that's 
my um, teaching is I want you to learn or memorize this information. Um, if you're not going to memorize it, then at least have it on your note sheet when you take your test because it's going to be very important. All of those transformation pieces and all of the key, five key points for each trig function. There are six trig functions and so you want to have those five key points for each of the six trig functions. Once you have that and you know how to do your transformations, you'll be able to graph the picture. And then the hard part is, is knowing what the basic um, graphs look like. So knowing that um, sine and cosine look like waves, knowing that um, tangent's gonna look like a cube function, cotangent's like a negative cube function, it goes the other way. And then cosecant and secant should have these, um, like a, um, like kind of like a parabola going upward and then a parabola going downward. They both have that, okay? So putting all that information together, hopefully you can get through the homework assignments. Um, I know they're a little all over the place. There's different kinds of problems. Um, notice that I just put two through eight and 14 through 15. There's no way for me to go over every single problem because even if you get one wrong and you do a similar one, it's gonna be completely different. Um, so I don't, I can't possibly do every iteration or every combination that you're going to see, but I figure if I give you the tools that you need so that you can apply any transformation and you can apply it to any basic function, any of the six trig functions, then you have what's necessary to figure out all these problems. You're not going to be left in the dark like I was where, oh, look, this is how you do example one, this is how you do example two, but then how the heck do I do homework problem number five, right? Um, so you really got to um, hone in on your generalizing skills and being able to apply what we've learned and the general concepts, general concepts being the key points and the transformation um, information, and then putting that together to do every single specific problem, okay? So I hope that helps. Again, if you have problems when you're doing the homework, you can always text me and remind, send me a picture of the problem you're working on, send me a picture of what you um, have done so far, and that would be the best way that I can help um, correct any misunderstandings or uh, identify any errors that you're making. That's the best way to learn it doesn't help when I just do the problems for you. I want you to know and understand what you're doing that's incorrect, that why you're not getting the answer correct, and um, how to fix that or how to, to, I guess, straighten your, your concepts out in your head so that you have, you have it down and you'll be able to repeat that performance on the test. But that is it for now.